Some studies suggest that South African equities have been within the top five equity markets over the last century. Over the last decade, South African equities have again proved their resilience by achieving far better returns than their global counterparts, despite selling down during the 2008-2009 subprime market crash. But what should one consider when investing into equities? Gentlemen, I welcome you to the program. Okay, so one thing that you need to consider is obviously returns. And I mentioned that over uh, the last decade, South African equities have been doing really well juxtapose that against what we're seeing in the uh, in the US with the Dow Jones and the S&P and we know that we've mm. done exceptionally well while we're starting to see the developed markets still being on that flat basis so let's do returns first Kobe okay I mean if you look at South African equities as an asset class um, and you look at it relative to the study you've just mentioned as a matter of fact the other two markets that have done as well as what the South African markets have done is Sweden and Australia both of those in Sweden you might not know but it's also been potentially resource rich in the past Australia as you know today is resource rich now most people if you ask them and you say to them which markets do you think of the last century have done the best that people say to you well I think it's the US I think the US have done far better than most other markets and that's actually not the truth yeah. now let's just at put least over the decade that's yeah correct well, actually as a matter of fact we go back longer for those numbers yeah. so we can go back for South Africa back to 1925 and those are the kind of the very very long-term numbers and if you go and you look at any markets like the Australian market and the Swedish market you've got numbers from a similar time period as well that you could compare so it's over the very very long very very long time if you look at those numbers let's just put South African equities quickly into uh, into perspective and let's look at the graph uh, that goes on, on on screen at the moment and I just want to kind of put the volatility of this asset class into into perspective so here I'm looking at the numbers I I, I, I spoke about just now which is since 1925 yeah. and I showed both on a rolling 12-month basis which is a dark line and it's very variable it looks a bit like a heartbeat relative to its rolling five-year return now the propensity to lose money over a rolling 12-month basis in the JSC all share is about 25% of the time. That means that 75% of the time you're making a positive return, but 25% of the time you're making a negative return. Once you up that to a five-year basis, that 25% only becomes about a 5%. And you can actually look at the periods uh, on, the, on, the, on the graph there, and you can see that the times that you would have lose, lost money on a five-year basis would be kind of in the 50s and potentially would have kind of been very close to it probably through the midpoints through the 70s. Look at the variability though of a rolling 12-month basis. You know, at best this market can give you a maximum on a rolling 12-month basis of about 125% per annum and it could be as low as about minus 47% and you can see 08 appearing there on the graph at, uh, at, that, at minus 40%, which is seriously, yeah. seriously negative number. So variability and return yeah. volatility you've got to get used to that okay all right so Roland uh, let's get a sense from you because when I think of the risks associated with South African equities there's one thing that springs to mind is that we are very heavily weighted towards the resource space and perhaps that is what has offered us great returns over the last century but things are changing quite dramatically I would think is that one of the biggest risks look the, the resource cycle is cyclical there are times when resources does really well um, tends to be sort of short brief periods but we have seen now a long sort of decade long period where they have done well but they are volatile um, there were also long periods where resources did not do do that well um, so yes absolutely the resource factor has played a role over the last uh, over the long run um, we mustn't forget that the RAND and I think the way we measure the South African returns is very important because if we're comparing them to global returns um, you know, if, if the RAND has been weakening, which, which uh, it did for a very long time, it, those returns in, in RAND terms look, um, you know, different than, yeah. than when the RAND is, is strengthening. So the, the, the RAND impact has to be taken into account. And I think the fact that the RAND is pretty much now again where it was a very long time ago because it weakened up to, you know, 10 and to the dollar and it's come down now again uh, or strengthened again to, to, to below 7. So the, the RAND has certainly uh, been a major driver of, of domestic Exactly. So when we see RAND strength, we see equity markets doing yeah. well. And it's correlated to the so resource cycle. Yeah. So there's like a, that double whammy effect that you Which is get. interesting because the resources don't really like a very strong RAND. Okay, let's get uh, Patrice involved. Patrice, thank you so much for joining us uh, on WealthQuest. Much appreciated. I mean, just hearing some of the, the rhetoric coming through from Kobe and Roland, we're talking about returns and we're talking about risks. What is your sense about investing in South African equities? Do you think that we are looking very strong relative to the other emerging markets and the developed world over not only the decade, but over the century? And would you say that our risks far outweigh the benefits or do you think that we are pretty safe where we are here in South Africa? I think, I think as a general principle, and, and um, Kobe already referred to the study, often you find that um, 
your highest returns are going to come from markets which are perceived to be more risky. So maybe Australia, which was a frontier country a century ago, Sweden has had its problems even with its banking system, and then South Africa. Um, again, the perception of risk often gets associated with higher returns. That's, that's one point to make. For us, the way we look at risk is not really volatility, but more the risk of losing capital for an investor, risk of losing part of um, his or her investment. And what's important to us is your entry point. So often, I think, a misconception in the industry is that just your holding period, being in the market for a long period of time, is going to save you. But um, I slightly disagree with that. If your entry point is such that you get in at the peak of a bubble, you will it will take a long while for you to get your initial capital back. So you referred already, look at the last 10 years in the US. The last 10 years in the US means that you would have got into the US market at the peak of the NASDAQ bubble. So no wonder that 10 years after, you still sort of down on your initial um, investment. Similarly, if you look at Japan 20 years plus ago, where we had the whole Japanese land bubble and the, 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 the Nikkei was way overvalued. If you got in there, it's no wonder that it's taken over 20 years for that to unravel. So your entry point is as important as your holding period. So just to say to spend a long time in the market, I think it's, it's missing part of the story. And that's why we focus a lot on valuation in terms of buying equities. I mean, Patrice is now saying exactly what I always say. Buy cheap, get return. Buy expensive, don't get return. Patrice, just put it for us in perspective quickly here. Uh, just take us through, from a sim perspective, um, what is the philosophy in the process? Is there an overarching equity philosophy and process, or is it different to the different managers that kind of manage the different kind of products at, at Solomon Investment Management? Just give us a quick recap there, just, 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 uh, just for the viewers so they can understand that. Sure. Um, we pragmatic in value investors at SIM, so that simply means that we look at value in terms of buying stocks which are trading below what we think it's they're worth. But we're also pragmatic, which means that, um, and Roland already referred to it, we've got a, a market which is very much influenced by large cyclicals, and we do realize that often you need to wait before selling out of, sh of shares which can go way above their intrinsic value. So we've, we've, um, if you take um, large uh, global cyclicals like resource stocks, they, can, they tend to collapse to way below what their intrinsic value is, and they tend to go up to way above what their intrinsic value is. So it's, it's difficult to have rigid rules to say, you know, we'll buy slightly below intrinsic value and sell, sell slightly above. That's why we call ourselves pragmatic value. But by and large, that is why being a value in investor is important because it forces you to focus on valuation and ignore the noise, like the macro factors and sentiment in the market or momentum. So we like to be contrarian and we like to look for situations where stocks are seen to be sort of too risky to invest in despite the fact that there is value. As an example, at SIM right now, we find value in European equities, which seems to be quite a contrarian call given the problems that Europe seem to find at themselves in from a macro point of view. Patrice, can I just jump in and ask you what your current view is on uh, the equity cycle within South Africa? We've seen um, probably an equity risk premium of about 5.8% over the last 20 years in South Africa above the cash. Um, at the moment, or over the, in, over the short term, over the last few years, including the, the credit crisis, we've had a higher risk premium. So equities have actually done very well relative to their long run average. Um, are, we, are we in a phase where equities are going to start correcting? Or, or what's Sim's view currently on the, on the equity risk premium? Yeah, we, we actually we, we think very much in the same framework as what you're describing, trying to compare real returns across um, asset classes versus their what they've, they've given us in, um, over a long term. We're thinking equities on that basis probably fairly valued. So versus other asset classes, we probably neutral um, local equity, um, underweight cash and bonds, and we see more value offshore. And, and that's partly based on the fact that we find that the RAND is very overvalued. So we think, yes, if, if you were looking at a domestic only portfolio, it would rather be in, in domestic equities and cash and or, or bonds. Uh, 
but um, given the fact that you can take money offshore, we'd rather be yeah. overweight offshore equity. Okay, Patrice, I'd like to get into some of the, uh, the technicalities when it comes to uh, equities as an asset class, if I may. And just looking at this rhetoric that we keep hearing about equities being an inflation hedge, do you buy into this story? I think that, I mean, in, in reality, it is true. I mean, if you were to compare equity to the other asset classes, uh, I'm using sort of bonds and cash here, are definitely in a high inflation environment, you don't want to be in cash because the, the real returns just collapse and you don't want to be in bonds. So from that point of view, equities would be a much better place to be. Of course, you know, there's now arguments for alternative asset classes like, you know, commodity, physical commodities or, or ETFs. Um, that's a bit more difficult to get exposure to. Um, in terms of a South African investor, just investing in the broad equity market gives you quite a large exposure to commodity stocks. So from that point of view, if you're talking um, as a hedge against inflation, I think our market lends itself quite well to that inflation hedge protection. And Patrice, you know, we keep talking about the fact that the rand is going to weaken at some point. I think everyone's expecting it. We don't know when it's going to happen. But at this point in time, it seems that most people are more uh, leaning towards uh, rand weakness uh, over the longer term as opposed to rand strength. Uh, and given just some of the, the comments made by Roland here, he was alluding to the fact that uh, the rand, rand strength equals equity strength as well. Uh, do you agree with that uh, correlation? Or do you think that it's, it's something that we should put aside and, and look at overall the value that the market offers us? Yeah, it's, I mean, we tend to use um, fair values as inputs in our evaluation. So we do, looking at the RAN on a purchasing power parity basis, we feel that it's probably 15% overvalued. But we use that fair value RAN in, in, in valuing equities. So yes, we do feel that um, it's probably the right time to take money offshore, given the fact that the RAN is strong. Unfortunately, many especially in the, on the retail side, you tend to find that a lot of the money tends to flow at the wrong time. Like we saw in 2002, after the rain had blown out, that's when a lot of money uh, flew out. So it's difficult to call. Um, reversion to the uh, PPP purchasing power parity levels can take a long time, um, five years, 10 years plus. But w what we're doing for investors now is, is to take, we, we have taken our allocation and, and put it um, offshore in, in a balance fund. So from that point of view, we do feel that over the longer term, that is the right time now to invest offshore. You see, I mean, I think, I think we're all saying exactly the same thing here today. And yeah. that is that um, there's a long-term trend for equities and those are up generally over time. But if you look at the S&P 500 and you look at what happened there over the last decade, well, that hasn't gone up. Yeah. That's actually lost money over the last decade. And we're sitting in an environment today where a lot of asset allocators are looking back in time and they're saying, well, look, this market can give you 15% per annum. You know, it's not, there, there's, no, there's no problem with that. But how robust is that number going forward? We're sitting in a much structurally lower inflation environment today than what we have been sitting in kind of in, in the past. Uh, we're also sitting with debt issues which are busy playing themselves out on a continuous basis, not only in Europe, but also potentially in the US. And as all these things kind of continue to kind of come home to roost, the question is, but how, what degree and how, how stable is this risk premium that you spoke about just now? How stable is the, the margin that you can make over above inflation? And, and then within that, you've got a whole valuation argument because then yeah. we're saying, like Patrice is you know, quite frankly saying quite rightly, he's saying, well, if you look at European equities, well, in their opinion, they offer more value, even though the South African market is fairly valued. And maybe, uh, Patrice, maybe just a question quickly for, you know, from my side to you. Um, if you look at the South African market and you look at equities maybe just generally globally, um, do you believe that uh, it'll continue to be the growth asset class over the next five to ten years or potentially would kind of asset allocators have to go find a different place in order to go and find growth for portfolios because if we can't get out of equities what will you get out of? It's quite interesting, uh, it's an interesting question because um, I think it's a bit of a fallacy to often associate returns with growth because I mean what we've seen from many studies is that a lot of in a lot of growth markets, it's very difficult to make money. I mean, take you know the ultimate growth market, China. You tend to find that you know large, uh, huge economic growth equates a lot of competition. So to just say that um, we're going to be in an, in an environment where there's low growth, 
Um, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad for equities. The other point I would raise here is the fact that there's been a lot written about the whole sovereign debt crisis and how that is bad for sort of risk appetite. Um, we look at this slightly differently at SIM. Um, the one thing we, we look at is the, the underlying strength of corporate balance sheets. So what you are likely to see is take the, the current issue with the debt ceiling in the US. Yes, the US might lose its triple A rating. I, I don't have a firm view on, on that. But we're not investing in, in US bonds. We're investing in US equities. And there, you can pick up Microsoft with a triple A rating, very strong balance sheet, cash flush, free cash flow yield of 12%. Yeah. And I don't see any reason, because the US loses its debt rating, that you know, we should sh shy away from investing in a company like this. We actually think that there's going to be a refocus away from you know, sovereign debt into much stronger balance sheets held by the corporate sector. Yeah. So um, maybe it's quite tenuous what I'm trying to, to get at. But again, we focus on valuations and the companies and businesses where we're investing, rather than trying to link the macro with the, 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 the equity investments that we're trying to make. Yeah. Okay, what's interesting to note, and uh, if I could paraphrase something that uh, Patrice said a little earlier, uh, perceptions that something that is far more risky will offer you far greater returns. Perceptions of, risks are, uh, of risk are changing quite dramatically. Credit Suisse came out with a report, in fact, yesterday, talking about that if we do see a, a default in the US, we could see stocks plunging by 30% and GDP falling by 5%. Do you think that Patrice is right that most uh, investors are going to be focusing on the strength of the balance sheets and U.S. companies, U U.S. multinational companies that are, have exposure to emerging markets are still going to be viewed as a company to invest in despite things falling apart uh, in the macro economy. Um, just to, to correct something you said earlier, on, higher um, risk is often associated with higher return. The, yeah. the, the actual definition is higher expected risk is associated with higher expected return. So um, it's not what the risk is, it's what the market thinks the risks are. And I think at the moment the market is thinking generally that there are massive risks in terms of in geopolitical the risks. World, uh, rather than emerging markets. No, absolutely, seems. absolutely. But uh, I, I do think that perceptions of risk are very high. And one of my main concerns is at the moment is, is inflation risk. So um, I actually sort of agree with the Credit Suisse kind of study that um, if there's any surprise on, on the inflation side, locally or globally, equities are going to tumble. We know that equities in the long run are a good inflation hedge, but it's at those kind of uh, at the cusp where these kind of yeah. new information comes to market or surprises to inflation, that's when equities can get really hurt.